Good afternoon and welcome to CIM's webinar series. Today we're having a case study. Mechanical seal upgrade helps nickel mine combat severe service conditions. Our panelists presenting today are Stephen Taylor, he's Canadian in mining segment manager and Atlantic Canada sales manager at John Crane. Stephen has over 30 years of mechanical seal design and troubleshooting experience. Also presenting is Michael Kalodimos, Global Product Manager at John Crane, and he has over 35 years of mechanical seal application and design expertise. My name is Guylaine Richard, Professional Development Officer at CIM, and my co-organizer is Michel Bicom, Managing Editor of CIM Magazine. And on behalf of all of our colleagues, we thank you for joining us. Now, some housekeeping before we get started. If you joined with your computer audio, make sure you selected the computer audio button on your control panel. And if you dialed in with a traditional phone, ensure the phone button is selected. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in the control panel. The questions will be held until the end for the Q&A period. And now, without further ado, we will turn over the webinar over to Stephen and Michael to kick off their presentation. Hello, everyone. Let's have a first look at the objectives of our webinar today. What we hope you'll learn. This webinar is going to offer some practical strategies to help you learn from the challenges faced in a nickel mine tailings pump application using slurry seals with face technology to overcome severe slimes processing duties. We're going to look at how to achieve mine KPI productivity goals using mechanical seal strategies to improve reliability. We're going to have a look at how to boost seal MTBR, mean time between repairs. We're going to talk about maximizing critical tailings pump equipment life cycle, how to cut maintenance costs, how to avoid unplanned and planned downtime, and of course, reduce water and energy waste during the mining process. Excuse me, Steve. Hi. You didn't you didn't select your screen to show. Okay. Are we there now? There we go. Perfect. Okay. All good. So yes, now we can see it. Perfect. Excellent. So Mike and I had originally planned on presenting this information at uh, CAM Vancouver this week. I imagine a few of you had probably planned on being there as well. And uh, quite a bit of our talk involves face protection and face shields for mechanical seals. Now I'm sitting here in Nova Scotia reading emails from my mining customer just this morning giving me instructions on personal face protection and face shields so very strange times indeed so i'm going to start with the most fun slide in my deck the water slide hey the material gets better i promise it has to so my name is steve taylor and today I'd like to talk about an adventure in mechanical sealing at an Eastern Canadian nickel mine. It's one that I've been on for a while now with my good engineering friend, Mike Kalodimos. This is the backstory on how we progressed from conventional mechanical seals to the technology that Mike is going to talk about. Dynamic lift upstream pumping faces for mechanical seals on high pressure tailings pumps. This started in 2006 as a quest by a metallurgical engineer to reduce pressure filter energy consumption by cutting back on the amount of water being injected into filter feed pump packing. So goal number one, reduce water. 
the initial driver in this case was to reduce energy consumption. Less water in the concentrate equals less work for the pressure filters. But we all know that there are plenty of other good reasons to cut water usage. If you work for a mine, you don't need me to list them. So the methods of sealing that we all find out there, there are three basic sealing choices used to keep centrifugal slurry pumps from leaking. The most common sealing option for slurry pumps is a stuffing box that uses braided fiber packing material to smother as much leakage as possible. Another choice is called an expeller seal. And then there's the option we'll be looking at today, mechanical sealing technology, the use of a set of very close clearance faces that run on a thin film of lubricant. So back to our filter feed pump. Our original filter feed pumps were sealed by a packed stuffing box. No surprise there, most big slurry pumps and mines are packed. And packing loves water. All of us who have been around mining pumps know this firsthand. They love each other. They really do. And it's hard to quantify the exact amount of water, but pump manuals will recommend using 15 liters per minute. But this is really a real world amount. In actual practice, probably between 30 liters a minute and usually closer to 60 liters a minute would be typical. So this is where I get involved. My job as an engineer who works for a mechanical seal company is to figure out a way to use seals to get rid of this water. And my even bigger job is to figure out how to do it as simply, reliably, and economically as possible. So, what seal are we going to use on our filter feed pump? All mechanical seal technology relies on a very thin film of lubricant. We've been over that between a rotating and stationary set of very flat wear faces. Whether this lubrication is provided by the fluid being pumped or by an introduced liquid, the consumption of this media is extremely low. Correct design choices and proper engineering can minimize or eliminate the need for external water flush. Mining slurry is a technically challenging application for mechanical seals. That's gonna be our understatement of the day in this presentation, very challenging. And the key factors we need to address before settling on a final seal system design are solids percentages, particle hardness, and particle size, all important drivers needed to come up with the correct seal design. So I told my metallurgist friend that uh, I'd give him a super rugged slurry seal that would work on his 70% nickel copper slurry. I knew going in that this particular slurry had already proven to have a healthy appetite for pump sleeves and liners. I wanted to go with zero water, but the stuff, it was making me nervous. So I asked and got the okay to use six liters per minute of water for internal cooling and lubrication. Still a far, far cry from what the packing needed. John Crane already had a nice workhorse single seal design called the Type 5860, which was meant to run with no water. It could handle a pile of impeller adjustment. It was very beefy, used a proprietary grade of porosity controlled silicon carbide face material, it was very good at scavenging water out of the slurry to keep the faces lubricated in poor conditions. But we did end up modifying this seal by installing a special shroud over the faces and hooking up a flush tube and that way we could sneak in our six liters per minute that I get nervous and ask for. We did look at a few different design options including pressurized dual seals but we decided to avoid as many bells and whistles and support equipment as possible. We went with the KISS principle which we all know stands for keep it simple, seal engineer. And so that brings us to the end of this chapter of our story. The seals worked even better than hoped for. And uh, then now they'd run for years on end without need for a replacement. This one was a Goldilocks story. We get rid of a lot of water. We didn't poke the bear too much or force the seal limits too, too far. Everything worked just right. 
So now, the big show, the tailings train. Two trains, five pumps each, varying in pressure from less than 150 PSI to over 700 PSI. The mine asked if I could use the filter feed seal on tailings. Higher speeds, higher pressure, nastier slurry. Hmm. Okay, we could redesign the faces for higher pressures, no problem. Then they asked if I could do it with no water injection. I don't think anyone else had ever tried this little stunt on pure tailings in this pressure range, and if they had, they were staying quiet about it. And I got to say, I'm very glad that the engineer at the mine, who I was now dealing with, was very patient. But they were having a lot of trouble with their bank of high pressure flush water pumps. The packing was a huge maintenance headache. Leaking tailings made a big mess, and of course, we wanted to get rid of the water content. So. We both agreed to give it a go, knowing we were trying something new. So back at John Crane, we did some finite element analysis, redesigned the faces, removed the shroud and the flush tube. I was pretty sure that the super silicon carbide material would find enough water to provide the required seal face lubrication, and we beefed up our drive color to a shrink disc design. So I know that no one really comes to a mining webinar to hear about a smooth running, well-performing mechanical seal. I know what you folks are really here for. You're, you're here for the big crash. And we did have a couple of crashes. There was steam and lots of tailings going in places that we didn't want it to go. The shrink disc used to attach the seal to the pump sleeve was supposed to handle the new, much higher axial forces. It didn't, it slipped. We did come up with carbide tip set screws. These things are great. They're working great. We're happy. I'm relieved. Next, would the faces run with no external water? No. This time, the slimes got the upper hand. There just wasn't enough free water for even the super silicon carbide. The tailings, too concentrated, too fine, too hard. And we went back to the water injection we came up with a better internal flow guide to keep the flush water around the seal faces and to resist the um, inherent high corrosion and erosion conditions presented by this application. So all of this took place over a few iterations and I'm happy now to say that all the work and patience has paid off and it was a very nice example of two companies trusting each other and working together. The seals are now routinely lasting over 16 months. Typical packing life used to be as low as nine days with three weeks considered a good run. We're seeing a large reduction in pump maintenance. And the same seals stay with the pump for multiple liner changes. And we have extremely happy millwrights. They detested packing these pumps. I'm told that if the mine ever switches back to packing, there'll be a revolt. And it really is cool to walk by a train of these pumps and not see a single drip of anything coming out on the floor. That, that is a personal pleasure of mine. I love it. So anyway, we've also been given the okay to start using smaller flush water pumps that will drop present water usage by a third from 33 liters a minute to 22 liters a minute. But unreliable flush water pumps are still an Achilles heel here and our ultimate goal is to get rid of them altogether. And here's the really good news. Uh, I think that we're there. So go ahead Mike, tell us the rest of the story about your upstream pumping technology and how we're going to get rid of that flush water. That's right Steve, thanks. Um, 16 months is, is pretty impressive and Steve went over and discussed the various choices the mine has to number one, improve reliability, and number two, handle uh, very difficult pumpage as shown on the far right of this slide. Um, high concentration of heavy, heavy solids, very uh, erosive solids, and the, the, chosen, uh, the, the chosen technology for that to extend the 16 months is a uh, dynamic lift upstream pumping seal. 
shown in the center of this slide. Mechanical seals require lubrication to operate just like packing. The idea here is to preserve the faces with a self-sustained and self-pressurized lubrication system. Dynamic lift upstream pumping does just that in a very novel manner. Um, here's, here's a picture of some seal failures from high, high solids applications and, and lack of adequate lubrication. Spiral grooves can be thought of as a sort of a mini pump, as, this, as, as a mini pump that, that sustains and generates a, a, a mechanical shaft seals lubrication system. So in these cases, no pressurized uh, system per se. The grooves pressurize a very small measure of water internal to the seal to pump into and against the process pressure. This lifts the seal faces, presenting, preventing friction and preventing wear and moves a low pressure water into a very high pressure stuffing box. So the dynamic lift upstream pumping grooves do that. They perform that task. The pressure profile generated by the grooves are quite different from a normal uh, mechanical seal, a full face contacting seal. These are non-contacting faces. So as the grooves rotate, the pressure profile can be seen, for example, in this view as non-linear. The grooves are taking low pressure water, creating a high pressure lubrication pad and moving that small volume of water into the process. We have an animation that attempts to, to illustrate this a little better. And, and in this animation, we'll illustrate how this technology works. It's a sort of within the seal cartridge view. So dynamic lift faces are applied to the inboard of an unpressurized seal arrangement. It's a, it's, it, com it comprises of two seals, an inboard seal, the one that protrudes, and an outboard seal that just contains the water. The spiral grooves rotate and literally pump low pressure water from inside the seal across the faces to sustain lubrication. You can see it in this animation. It'll pass across the seal face at the outside diameter. The OD of the seal face is shown there with that little plume of blue clean liquid. Uh, this is shown actually on, a, on an ANSI pump, but we'll show you how this works on our big tailings seals as well. The outer, the outer diameter, diameter of the inboard seal, that's where that nonlinear pressure profile is developed. Um, we'll also show this little FEA, this finite element analysis of how the grooves build pressure. That's, that's really to illustrate exactly where this pressure is created. And you'll notice it cre it's created at the point of the groove as a result of that diminishing area. So there are a host of advantages to this technology, and the main takeaway seems to be the incredibly effective lubrication pad that the faces both provide and sustain. No high pressure water injection, no expensive and complex water pumps to feed glands, just a low pressure supply of relatively clean water delivered to the grooves. Again, here's, here's, here's the technology actually applied to a, to a large um, 5860 seal um, in a heavy duty dynamic lift upstream pumping application. We can see that the face is much bigger than what was shown in the animation. The inboard face has, ha, uh, takes advantage of the spiral grooves. Water, low pressure water flows into the gland, is contained by an outboard seal, Operating at very low pressure, we can see the pressure map at the bottom. So we see atmosphere, buffer pressure, that's the buffer water that goes in, groove pressure, much higher than box pressure, and then box pressure. So this is sort of the secret sauce of a upstream pumping arrangement. We recall the damage faces shown in the previous slides where where uh, high solids and, and poor lubrication have resulted in tearing the seal completely apart. 
these are seal faces. These are upstream pumping dynamic lift seal faces that were that are used uh, that were used in the tailings application and came out virtually undamaged. So these seal faces look almost brand new. Here's the the very simple water system that's used to to supply the uh, dynamic lift up from pumping seal. We use a utility water reservoir, so we fill this with relatively clean water, which is which is quite a statement in the mine. But if the, if the water we have available is not clean, we can filter that water. But the point is, we we fill a box with water, we deliver that water through stainless steel piping to the gland. Um, typically, this is done with just head pressure. So we're talking about a low pressure water into the gland and the grooves developing a high pressure uh, passage and dynamic lift that pumps upstream into the process. Now, in the case where we want to pressurize that water, we can do that quite easily with a pressure pot. Um, even an old seal, converted seal pot can be used. But this illustrates how simple the support system can be for a dynamic lift upstream pumping seal. So there are a host of benefits uh, that upstream pumping and dynamic lift technology can, uh, can deliver. I think the main takeaway is reliability. The grooves are going to successfully deliver clean lubricating water at extremely high pressure right where it's needed. And, that, and that's at a very low volume as well. That water consumption is going to be extremely low, from two to five gallons per day per 24-hour period, depending on the application. These grooves in the little reservoir are it. That's the whole system. So the technology is going to eliminate flush water pumps and gland water pumps and expensive, you know, water delivery systems that are used today. I think we've arranged for some question and answer uh, period, and I encourage you to check out our link at the end of the webinar that'll guide you back to the uh, upstream pumping dynamic lift um, animation. Well, thank you very much, Stephen and Michael, for a very interesting presentation. Um, we will now start the question period, and just as a reminder, please type your questions into the question box in your control panel. So first question, what new things did you learn thanks to being on site, in person, for the SEAL installations? Steve? <laughs> Well, that, that's a big question because there's a, <laughs> we learned a lot. I've been to the this particular mine site several times myself. Mike has been there once, and uh, it is very eye-opening in some cases. And w w one thing that's real particularly interesting, Mike said, relatively clean water. Well, gee, there's a whole lot of water to pick from. A lot more than I knew on site. The processed water, reclaimed water, raw water, filtered water potable water so uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know I had such a variety to choose or in a few of those cases avoid so uh, the, the water selection was interesting and also picking your right pressure source as well is, is that guy with the hose going beside you going to cause a 50 psi drop in your seal or not be careful so um, what else did I learn hardened parts we talked about our frank disc and uh, and our tungsten set screws everything's hard had uh, at a mine it's not a refinery with your little 316 stainless steel parts you, you're dealing with high chrome equipment so if uh, you have a seal or, or any other piece of equipment that's going to see any amount of axial thrust well get ready to handle it because you're going to need something good to grab onto whatever you're attaching yourself to uh what else the slurry pardons yeah. i'm sorry yeah. i was going to no. say hardened hardened salesmen too you have to have hardened sales engineers this don't is not send. this is not simple uh simple duty these this is this is remote these are very long days yeah don't and take your soft salesman to the mine <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, what else the the flexibility of the slurry pumps actually that that was a, a 
a pleasurable discovery. Slurry pumps are a lot easier, in my opinion, to work on than your ANSI or your API pumps. It's not a big thing if you ask the mine, can we switch from that expeller or switch from packing to your mechanical seal? And sure, yeah, we'll just put a new adapter in and no problem at all. So yeah, that was good. Uh, that's about it. The cafeteria food was great. Great variety of cookies, better than I expected. I, I have a cookie problem, so <laughs> that, that place fed right into me. But anyway, that's about it. Okay, and um, at what speed or RPM? I think quite a bit of what we also um, learned is before what we could possibly need. Extra set screws, extra tools, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get your get your kit together before you show up. Make sure you know what fittings you're going to be using and do your homework. It's not like you can, like Mike says, you can't just drive to the Ace Hardware store and grab something. So, uh, good note to mine and good note to suppliers. Where we both. were. In, yeah, yeah. In, in, another interesting. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking over you a little bit because my audio is a little delayed. But, but another I, another interesting feature that I that I took away was to be sort of extra prepared for how the standard operating procedure, the SOPs are for pump startup and pump operation. You're right in saying that the pumps are simpler than I anticipated, but the startup procedure is every bit as uh, nuanced as in a chemical uh, chemical plant, as, as some of my chemical plant friends like to remind me, you know, we're not pumping water on the farm here. These are, these are processes that are much heavier than water and require some some real care in starting pumps and stopping pumps, et cetera. So in our case, we're using a, a technology that relies on dynamic movement to pump water across that inboard face. And uh, we want to get up to speed as quickly as possible. Well, that's fine, but if you're working with these tailings that we showed a couple different pictures of, they're three times heavier than water. So that startup is going to be, we need really need to pay attention to how these soft starts are programmed in. So we reach maxima, maximum operating speed uh, as quickly as we can. It's not an impediment to the design or anything. It's just we should know what going in up front so there's no surprises. Right. We, we can compensate or design for that without any problem, but just let us know up front. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here about what speed or RPM are these operating at in order to operate correctly? That's a good question. There are minimum speeds. We like to keep we like to keep the shaft speed above a thousand RPM. And that's very dependent on pressure also. So the so the stuffing box pressure uh, is going to dictate how fast our, how slow our slowest speed should be. Um, basically, we try to keep it above 1,000 RPM. These are operating, I believe, at 1450. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and we can design the groove to suit as well. I mean, not every out-of-the-box upstream pumping seal is meant to handle 700 PSI, or, or in this case, we can go up to 900 PSI with these, but mm -hmm. just working with us telling us the application so yeah these, these ones are unique but it's not unique for us to design something special for whatever application you have so um how how are the usp faces on intermittent cavitation and pressure spikes excellent question um and, and it and it allows me to quote one of our design engineers who referred to upstream pumping dynamic lift seals is quite laid back in their behavior. Um, once, once the spiral groove develops a, a lubrication pad, um, that lubrication pad in water, uh, the barrier fluid, buffer fluid in these cases is, is clear water. Um, once water is pumped to that groove point, it's at a very, very high pressure right at the point. So as it as it spreads and that water is forced into the stuffing box upstream, uh, the stiffness of that lubrication pad is amazing. Um, we can we can suffer through all sorts of cavitation.
and hydraulic movements that these big pumps uh, and even small ANSI pumps can can take. Impressive how how uh, these pumps could really hammer around and the seal faces are undamaged just fine. And is there a stuffing box pressure limitations? No. <laughs> well, if, if you get say, something about I would say the, um, no. I, I think we have designs. Yeah. Look, look. Uh, ahead, if you have if you have something above 900 psi, bring it on. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll go after it. But we're already up to 900 psi, and I don't know. I don't think you're going to find too many places or, or or especially tailings trains that long are going to beat it. But yeah, you know what? You got it. We'll match it. So so we're not too worried. But give give me the scientific answer, Mike, please. Yeah, there there isn't there isn't a fantastic scientific answer. They will pump very very efficiently, uh, and that's again based on the viscosity of what we're pumping water in this case um there there are other applications in other industries uh for produce water in the in reinjection pumps and deep deep sea uh applications where pressures can go even higher and part of the engineering there is to apply something that's even more viscous than water so sometimes a purity oil is used sometimes uh sometimes a a, a heavy uh a heavier um liquid such as um oh vegetable oils mineral oils uh kerosenes they, they can be applied also so it's it's really a, it's really a process it's really a barrier fluid that matches the process fluid so in all these mining cases we talk about water but in chemical uh in refinery applications these seals work very well with uh with heavier fluids but but that that pumping efficiency and that that ability to create a stiff lubrication pad is dependent on velocity uh groove design and um and the viscosity of what you're what you're pushing through okay um do you run a return back to the reservoir or just dead head into the outboard seal it's a great question. In some cases, we can run back to the reservoir, and and that takes a little more, uh, a little fancier system than what we've installed uh, in most mines. In most mines, we we run that small small amount of water out of the seal gland um, it, to a to a drain, and 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 really that's the amount of water that's that's pumped by our by our containment seal pumping ring. So it's a very small amount of water that we've been pushing to drain. It's it's uh in in the amount of water water passing into the process is as we said very low indeed, two gallons a day, maybe five gallons. Again, all of that is dependent on the velocity and the pressure that we're running at. I think it's important too that whatever design you put in there. I, I think it should also be remembered that. Go ahead, Steve. No, I'm sorry. We have choppy audio here. But yeah, wh wh whatever design we supply, we have to, on our end, recognize that it's going at a remote mine site and uh, changing crews, work in the middle of the night, some uh, challenging conditions. And we're not concerned about it with this one. With actually, the seal in place now has already been put through its paces. It, it did literally see the 50 psi drop due to some hosing and uh, I actually saw quite an increase more than what we thought to 100 pounds for a little run without any water coming out so uh, it's it's pretty flexible and versatile the seal and if uh, if it was finicky and fussy I don't think it'd be the place for it but it's not so no they're quite laid back as as our design our design as you said very technical term they're quite laid back and and the reason they can be so laid back is we're we're quoting these pressures like 50 psi 40 psi 100 psi the seals actually designed to opt to pump against a 900 psi stuffing box with about 5 psi of water delivery so there's no no mistake there in the audio it's 5 psi so if we we can deliver that water with head pressure to the seal gland and that tiny amount that tiny pressure of water can be built to 900 um, 
But as Steve said, we we have 40 psi water. We use 40 psi water, um, and it's still quite a bit less than the than the nearly 14,000 gallons per water per day, gallons of water per day that uh, that a flush seal would operate with. Twice that probably for packing on these shaft sizes. So we're talking two to five gallons a day. Okay. Um, how does the seal handle variations in due to operating at var varying points on curve low flow to higher flow? I think that's what you were talking about earlier, Mike, as far as cavitation <laughs> conditions and varying conditions going on. Bad stuff going on inside the pump. How does the seal handle that exactly. on the outside? Exactly. Um, and I think so long as we maintain shaft velocity and we maintain water on the seal, uh, the seal the seal can glide right through these uh, gyrations that low flow can. Okay. Cavitation, uh, violent uh, impeller pounding, that kind of thing. The 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 stiff on a on a seal on a polished you know silicon carbide seal face uh, should not be underestimated. That is that is a very very stiff support system. So it, it's a fascinating technology in that regard. It's very you know laid back is said to be a funny kind of a kind of a humorous way of of describing the seal. Extremely durable, I think, is uh, characterizes it very well. Okay, and uh, one last question. Is there any temperature limitations? Yeah, that's, excellent question. That's it? That's that's your hard last question, Guy Lynn? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's yeah. a good one, though. That's a good okay. one. Go ahead, um, Mike. Yeah, we, we try to normally uh, limit the pressure to below the boiling point of of the uh, of the barrier or buffer fluid, but that boiling point, as we know, can be manipulated with pressure on the delivery system. So, in cases where we have to run with water, uh, for example, some some boiler feed water applications where these upstream pumping grooves are, have been used in the past have been extremely challenging applications and, and that water is like 280 degrees. I mean, much higher in the, you know, much higher energy in the boiler feed uh, fluid itself, but the water that we're, that we're trying to recirc and use can be like 270 degrees. So we have to put enough pressure on the, on the delivery system to avoid boiling the uh, supply water. And that, that's another reason for quote unquote matching the, uh, the buffer fluid with the process fluid, something the process fluid likes would be great for uh, for upstream pumping dynamic lift. So in in heavy kind of heavier hydrocarbon applications, uh, very often kerosene is used as a as a barrier fluid in in those cases. And pumped upstream, yes, it's somewhat dilutive, but it's it's very friendly to the process fluid. If the process fluid is say you know some kind of heavier hot crude or bottoms or something like that. So there are limits, but we can manipulate the limits with pressure. Okay, well, I think Gilin's gonna wrap us up, Mike. So thank you everybody exactly. for signing in and uh, giving Thanks us your, your audience. I, I wish we were in Vancouver and I don't know, uh, Las Vegas is coming up. Who knows about that? And if not, we'll see you in Montreal. Thanks. That's right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Stephen and Michael, for joining us today. It was a great presentation. Wish I was in Vancouver as well, but it's, I think this it went well. Um, so if your question was not answered, or if you have any further questions, please forward them directly to the presenters. Uh, we're going to put their contact information on the screen. If not, just email me and I will email uh, your questions to them directly. Um, I, so thank you to all our attendees. Um, I would ask, please fill out the short survey that pops up on your screen at the close of the webinar. And a link to the video recording will be emailed to you tomorrow.
and the video will also be available on the cim.org website. So thank you, everybody, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.